and welcome to our worship service this morning. We're so glad you're here. It's always great when we can be in fellowship together. And I don't think there's any announcements this morning, but I just want to thank those people that are here. Well, it's on, and he's not up there. No mic at all? Well, I might have to speak very loudly then, right? We'll see what happens. Um, I just want to thank those that are participating in the service this morning. It's so nice to have Ann Leach here and Patty with her loyalty behind me with the organ and to have Skip and everyone up there trying to take care of things for us. We do appreciate it. So just sit back and relax and enjoy being preparing your hearts for worship. Please stand and join me in the call to worship. This is the day that the Lord has made. Let us rejoice and be glad in it. Help us to seek your truth. We gather in your name to celebrate the good news of Jesus Christ. Thank you for the gift of freedom and in the knowledge that we have Jesus Christ as our Savior. May the presence of the Holy Spirit, Spirit fill, fill this sanctuary, sanctuary as we, as we worship, worship together. together. Okay, join me in the hymn number 130. God will take care of you.
may be seated. Now we welcome Anne to do special music. Patty's on his way down. Glad to see you all here this morning. Nice and bright and sunny outside, isn't it? Are we having any luck? We don't have Sean this morning is the problem. Would you all stand for the doxology? Praise God from whom all blessings flow. Praise him all creatures here below. Praise him. Heavenly Father, you tell us in the book of Acts that it is more generous and a blessing to be able to give than to receive. 
We thank you this morning for allowing us to share of our resources that it might be used not just for this church, but to help around the world. And in all these things, we give you the thanks and the praise, Lord, in your precious name. Amen. Please be seated. I will try to speak as loud as I possibly can. Well, there is a mic down there. I wonder if it's working. No, it's okay. Yeah. Is it working? I don't think so. Okay. God is good no matter what is happening here in the sanctuary. And I'm not sure, I think most, do we have children that want to come down for the children's moments? I know we had a lot at the 8.30 service. Good, here come a few. And Pam's gonna come down and meet them. You'll sit right down in the front row, that'd be great. Oh, wow, okay. Thank you. Okay, kids, do you see that red toaster? This morning I thought I'd get up, have a piece of toast and a little bit of juice. I did like I always do, I put the toast in, I pushed it down. Guess what happened? I didn't get any toast. It popped up and it was just as white as it had been before I put it in there. And now this is ridiculous. I mean, they make these toasters to make toast, right? Do you like toast? Do you like it with jam or jelly or peanut butter? Yeah, okay. I've got a snack waiting for you in a minute. But I noticed that somehow the plug had been pulled out of the wall. I don't remember doing it, but it wasn't connected. And what I know is if it's not connected to the wall, I'm not going to get any power. Well, you know, that's a little bit like the way it is with God. If we stay disconnected from him for too long, we don't get anything. We're just trying to do it all on our own power. So this morning when you're having your snack, you remind Pam to make sure that she plugs it in so you can have your snack, okay? All right, let's have a word of prayer together. Dear Heavenly Father, I thank you for these children. They are so special and precious in your sight. Help them always to grow up remembering that you're their source of power that will help them to make good decisions and to be the children you created them to be. And we pray it in your precious name, amen. Okay, you can go ahead out, but remember to take the toaster with you. Would you stand with me? And you're gonna find out later on why I have chosen these particular hymns. But would you stand and sing the hymn, America the Beautiful?
Dear Heavenly Father, we give you thanks this morning for a glorious weekend when we're celebrating oil festival days, for families coming together, for being able to recognize the things that are important when we're together in fellowship, especially this morning, Lord. We may have some visitors here that we need to welcome to let them know how glad we are that they're sitting here in church with us. And for those that are watching on television later on today, Lord, we give you thanks. They may remain invisible to us, but they are visible to you. Lord, we ask that you might be with us during the hard times and the joyful times. Never let us take for granted all that we have and all the blessings you have given to each one of us. And Lord, I particularly thank you for a blessing of being able to be here today knowing that Pastor Larry is able to relax, enjoy his family, and to be able to know that his church is thriving, and that we are here in the presence of the Holy Spirit, gathered together as we pray your prayer by saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. Our scripture lesson for this morning comes to us from the Gospel of John, chapter 8, verses 31 through 36. Jesus then said to the Jews who had believed in him, if you continue in my word, you are truly my disciples and you will know the truth and the truth will make you free. They answered him, we are descendants of Abraham and have never been in bondage to anyone. How is it that you say you will be made free? Jesus answered them, truly, truly, I say to you, Everyone who commits sin is a slave to sin. The slave does not continue in the house forever. The son continues forever. So if the son makes you free, you will be free indeed. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Well, this morning, I wanna share a story with you as I begin the sermon. Some of you know I grew up in Pittsburgh but most of you probably don't know that I attended a very small country church, a rural church that had a wonderful pastor by the name of George Taylor, an older gentleman, and was he ever a gentleman? He would go to homes to make visits, he'd go to the hospital, he'd preach right from God's word every Sunday morning. And I was inspired. I thought he was just great. When I was about fifth or sixth grade, they decided that, um, he decided, I guess they didn't decide, that he was going to retire. And so they started looking for a new pastor that would have a vision for bringing people back to the churches. Don't we still have that vision today? And as they started looking around, they found this young pastor from Franklin, PA, by the name of Dale K. Milligan. And when he was being interviewed by them, he said to them, I love this little church. It was created in 1784, but I have to tell you something. If you hire me, I have this vision from God that that property that you own up on the hill, that property is going to become a large church complex. And I wanna see a cross in the front of this church that goes up high on this two lane highway. And every time people go by, they're gonna see this cross with a crown and they're going to go ahead and say, I wonder what's happening over there. Maybe we should go to church there. Well, the sanctuary seated a thousand people. It's a fairly large church. The little one only seated about 100, 120. And I've put pewter plates up on the piano showing you the old little rural church and a 200th celebration of it in 1984 when it became a very large church. Well, let's go three years later. I'm in ninth grade, I'm 14 years old. 
and we've all been confirmed in the class, and the pastor says to us, now I wanna tell you, we're having you Sunday in three weeks, and so I'm gonna sign the parts for you. So all the things we did today, the call to worship, responsive reading, the prayers, the children's moments, I'm gonna assign them to each one of you. And so he goes through all the class, and then he turns to me and he says, and you're going to preach the sermon. I thought, oh, no, I'm not. I'm in ninth grade. I'm 14. I am sure there must be juniors or seniors that are going to do a much better job than I am. I think I turned into Moses for the moment. Well, he said, no, no, I'm sorry. You're going to preach the sermon. And I thought, oh, wow. You know, the lectern was kind of like where Anne was standing earlier. But the pulpit in this church was meant for a very large, booming voice of a person. You had to go up three steps to get into it. And it was a great big square. It was very intimidating. I do not remember a thing I said that day. Not one thing. Now, here we are, 62 years later, and I'm up in the pulpit again. My knees get shaking, my hands perspire, my throat gets dry, and I keep thinking, what is the common thing I had between ninth grade and today? I was a seeker. I wanted to know what God's will was for my life. And you know, God is so faithful that he began a journey in ninth grade that led me to where I am today. But if I hadn't sought out God's truth, where would I be? And that's what I want to talk to you about today. We can be a blessing no matter where God puts us. But oftentimes he asks us to stretch ourselves a little bit more than we're really ready to do. And I think that's what he was doing with me. And I have a feeling that as Pastor Larry decided he was going to take his first three-week vacation, and he asked Richard Dutton and Jeff Childs and myself to preach, we all said yes, maybe with a little fear and trepidation. But we did it because we knew how important it is to be with family and to be on vacation. So today on your bulletin cover, if you'll take it out, I want you to see that I have three words written there. In the upper left corner is the word truth. In the middle is the word freedom superimposed upon the cross. And on the right hand side is the word peace. Well, what is the answer to the foundation for our lives? It is God's truth. And how do we find God's truth? By opening up the word, by reading his scriptures. So I have a question to ask you. I think all of you have Bibles in your house. What I'd like to know is, where are they? Are they on a shelf? I do have a lot of Bibles on a shelf on a bookcase in my family in the living room. Is it on a coffee table, kitchen table, bed stand? Have you opened it for a while? I know you all have them. God's truth cannot come to us unless we open up his word and seek to understand it. God can't give us understanding through his love letter to us if we are not faithful and true and trying to find it. So I wondered basically, do you read the Bible and totally understand it? Because I don't. I read the Bible. But there are times when I wonder, what is he trying to tell me? What am I supposed to get out of this very thing? And it says in the Bible in Mark, when they see what I do, they will learn nothing. When they hear what I say, they will not understand. Otherwise, they will turn to me and be forgiven. Why would it tell us if we're really trying hard that we're not gonna understand? We have to have the knowledge of what lies behind the words. And when even we speak it up from the pulpit, you have to be open to the Holy Spirit who entered in here before we came this morning. I believe there's a presence of the Holy Spirit with us. And he wants to give us the understanding of what the words say. But I wonder, where do we seek truth sometimes? Do we seek it from the Bible? Do we seek it from the government? politicians, people in authority, or do we really want God's truth that we find in the Bible? As Jesus explained the parable of the sower and the seeds, and I know you all know it, 
but do you know it? Do you understand what he was trying to tell us in 2021 about this parable? And why speak when people don't have understanding? Even the disciples said to him, after he preached this, he said, we don't understand. And he said, let me explain it to you very easily. For all those seeds that are on a, a trough, a path, nothing happens. They get pushed down and they don't produce anything. And then they, they said, well, what about the ones in the rocky soil? Well, you know, they, they heard, they were filled with joy. The blossoms came up, but they couldn't go deep enough to get beyond where they needed to hear. The thorns, when you, when you put something into a thorny bush, it gets choked out. That's when you listen to the worries of the world and the concerns, and you really don't understand what it is you want to be doing. But then he ends with a victorious kind of a statement. Do you understand that some of the seeds, some of you are going to go out of here and you're going to somehow share that you're a Christian, that you went to church this morning, and people are going to hear you and they're going to find out that not only will it produce 30, 60, 100 seeds more than what it was planted, because Jesus is present. Now we're having a ladies conference on October the 9th, and the topic is going to be uh, faith over fear. I would encourage all the ladies, I'm sorry gentlemen, unless you want to park cars, you can't be there. Um, I want to encourage you to open yourself up to go to conferences, to go to Bible studies, to go to Sunday school classes, so you can hear what God's truth really is. What does it mean to believe in the truth of God? In Sunday school, we're studying the book of Revelation. And a couple weeks back, we were talking about the believers in Thyatira, those people who were already following Jesus and believed in him. And he said to them all, those of you that are believers, I don't want nothing from you, nothing, except to hang tightly to what you believe in. Why did Jesus try to encourage those believers to hang on tight? Because he, at that point, he was worried that they would be affected by the wiles of the world, the, the evils, and he said, hang tight to it, don't let go. That's what happens when you follow God's truth. So that's our, our cornerstone up at the top of your bulletin. But next we have the flags, and I brought them up here up front this morning. And I think you're very familiar with the American flag. We pledge allegiance to it. We appreciate the fact that we know that many years ago on June 14th of 1777, the American flag was created. And it was created with 13 stripes and 13 stars to represent our 13 colonies. Today, the same thing is true with the stripes. We have seven red stripes that are alternating with six white stripes, and they represent all the 50 states with the stars. Have we forgotten the price that people paid in order for us to have that American flag in front of us? Sometimes it is so easy to get caught up in our life that we forget to appreciate the freedoms that many godly men and women, some died, in order for us to have that kind of a freedom. I think you all know the Pledge of Allegiance. Would you stand for a minute and just say it with me? I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the public for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, for liberty and justice for all. Do you know there's a Pledge of Allegiance to the Christian flag? Are you aware of that? Many churches, Christian churches, do not have the Christian flag. I'll tell you a little bit about it but I also want us to pledge allegiance, maybe for the first time, to the Christian flag. I pledge allegiance to the Christian flag and to the Savior for whom kingdom it stands, one brotherhood uniting all mankind in service and in love. 
You can be seated. The Christian flag is not, like I said, found in all Christian churches. It was created in the uh, late 20th century, uh, about 1897, and it was supposed to represent all of Christendom, all religions, all the people who had Christianity as their basic faith walk. There's a white field on it. The white field stands for Jesus' purity. There's a red cross, a Latin cross on it. It stands for the blood that Jesus shed on Calvary for all of us. It also stands for Jesus' faithfulness. And the blue, the blue represents baptism. It represents a cleansing of ourselves, becoming new and transformed through the blood of Jesus Christ. Never had a patent. Danny Crosby wrote a song entitled The Christian Flag, and it wasn't really accepted or adopted till 1942. I think as we say the Pledge of Allegiance, what we're doing is we're pledging allegiance to Jesus Christ. We're pledging allegiance to the Christian truth that I talked about. It stands for more than just anything else but our freedoms, which is right in the middle of your bulletin. But you can't have freedom, truly freedom, unless it is placed upon the cross. Jesus Christ has to be at the foundation. And I thought about the fact that when I was little, I grew up saying the Pledge of Allegiance to the Christian flag. And when I first moved here, Isla Olson, if any of you remember her, she ran Children's Church and she had us doing the pledge. We were the teachers, but she was the one who led the Children's Church. And she always wanted the kids to remember that you also pledge allegiance to your faith, to your beliefs, what you believe upon. So that's why that's in the middle of the bulletin. But I also wanted to talk about the word peace. Peace comes at a price. And I've noticed oftentimes that um, we take our freedoms and our peace so for granted. There are 43 references to peace in the Old and New Testament. And a couple weeks ago when Richard Dutton was preaching, he was talking about billboards and bumper stickers. And one of the ones that he mentioned was one that I remember seeing on my way to Brookville one day. And he was talking about this billboard sign that said basically, if you do not know God, you are not gonna be able to find peace. N-O, no God, no peace. But when you K-N-O-W, when you know God, you will find a peace that passes all understanding. It tells us that in the Bible. That peace is one of the things that we seek on a regular basis. In John 14, 15, what Jesus asks us to do is to accept two gifts from him, gifts of the Holy Spirit, which dwell in here. When he left, he said, I want you to have that Holy Spirit to give you a sense of direction, to let you know what you need to be doing, and to guide you. But then he also said, I want you to have a peace, a peace that the world cannot give you, but a peace that I can give you. It'll be a peace that gives you a sense of joy and delight, but it will also give you a calmness, a calmness that you might require whenever you're going through a rough patch. And you will. The Bible says troubles will always be with you. But I think that Jesus wants to make sure that we understand it comes from a price. Freedom came from a price. With, with freedoms comes responsibility. We have to continue to be careful that we are still seeking the freedom God wants us to have. Well, I want to give you an example of something that um, can sneak in very, very kind of shyly. We aren't always aware of it. It's kind of a stupid example, to be honest. But we just changed refuse company. And I keep thinking about my garbage cans when I go to pick them back up on a Thursday morning or a late Wednesday afternoon. I put out a garbage can. I put out a recyclable bin. Garbage out, bring them back empty. Garbage out, and I thought, Oh, that's a little bit like church. You know, we bring the garbage in, and Jesus says, I took it away, it's gone. You don't need to worry about it anymore. So this one day when I was going to bring the garbage cans in, 
I looked out. I'm at the top of my driveway. It's a fairly long driveway. And I thought, where's my recyclable bin? I mean, did, did they roll in the can? Did they give it to a neighbor? What happened to my recyclable bin? And just before I got to the garbage can, I had this thought. I wonder if the garbage people were being so considerate that they put it inside my garbage can, so I just needed to walk up one thing. Why did I go negative first? It's stupid. I mean, why was I thinking the worst of the garbage people when what they had done was something wonderful to help me out? Now, I don't know if they'll do it again, but what I do know is that it made me rethink my life, as stupid as that may sound, because do I oftentimes let the garbage of negativity come in and forget to replant it with positive things? I think today what I wanted you to learn from this particular sermon was that if you have God's truth in your heart, if you read your scriptures and you pray, you will be free because the Bible says that God's truth will set you free. And then later on it says, and I will give you peace. Not the peace that the world gives, but I will give you peace. When I chose the hymns for today, they were chosen very carefully. The first one speaks to God's truth. He will take care of you. No matter what happens, no matter what you're going through, God loves you and God will take care of you. But God also wants to set you free from all your worries and your concerns, some of them that never even happened. He wants to set you free. And that's why we sang America the Beautiful. But now we're gonna sing, let there be peace on earth. It's something that I think we all want, we desire, but the only way we can attain true peace is to open our hearts to God and to ask him to be present with us. So would you stand and sing, let there be peace on earth. sanctuary today. The prayer is that you will take God back out with you into the community. Share him with others who need to hear his word. Don't be afraid. Be bold. He'll give you the confidence to do it. And may the peace and the joy and the God's truth be with you all in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Ghost. Amen.